morning, Logos. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's really great. I said it yesterday, but I'll say it again. It's really great honor and privilege to be with you guys this weekend and to uh, worship with you. Um, but I have been, you know, I have been a little bit homesick. You know, it's, it's only been like a day or two, but I, when I got, it started when I, uh, I went back to my group Friday and I started to unpack. And uh, my wife and I have been very busy here tonight, so usually she helps me back. Uh, I was kind of... I was kind of limited on time, so I packed it myself. And as I started to unpack my bag, I realized I had forgotten my glasses, uh, which she would have definitely helped with that. I forgot, I brought my computer cable as a charging board, but I didn't bring the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I realized that I, I, I had packed most of my toothpicks, but I had forgotten to pack my toothpicks, which wasn't really a problem until. Because Pastor David and I were sharing a room, and I got back last night and I realized that I did not have a toothpaste. <laughs> so, like a single man, I used to be hand soap, <laughs> which I would uh, definitely advise against. Uh, but uh, it's been a great time. Like, I, you know, people have said, like, you know, next time you should bring your wife. And, and I think, you know, she would have really had a great time here. She would have really had a great time. Little things remind me of her and, and kind of make me think about her. Things that she would do. She would love to meet all of you guys because you've been so warm and inviting. You know, she's in her like early thirties, been married for like eight years, but our church is so young that she's like the elderly woman. You know, like, everybody comes to her for advice. So she would love to uh, sit with women her age or maybe a little bit older and just you know, soak up some of that wisdom in terms of motherhood and marriage. So she would love that. She would love the scenery. Uh, <coughs> The, the, the songs that are a little bit older that we've been singing, yeah, she would have, I mean, she would have. <laughs> those are songs that we sang when we were in high school or college. Um, and I know that Daniel was, Daniel was talking about, you know, to the youth, like, these are precious here, and it really is true. You know, because those songs, we sang them when we were so young and idealistic and hopeful, and it brings a lot of that, that energy and most importantly, as a, uh, as a Korean-American female, she would have loved eating the cup ramen with you guys. Because uh, that's something she's been trying to implement at our church, at our retreats, and she'll bring these big boxes of shin ramen, and then people just don't touch them. She's always a little bit sad about that. <laughs> but so a lot of little things have kind of made me think about my wife. And today, we're going to be looking at this passage in Ephesians. And we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. And that actually reminds me of the story with my wife, because in all of our years together, so we've been married for eight years, we've been together for ten, the single biggest fight slash argument that we ever got into was not about finances. It wasn't about cultural differences, me being Chinese American or me being Korean American. It wasn't about parenting methods. But honestly, the biggest fight we ever got into was about this topic of spiritual warfare. You see, we had just, uh, we were visiting New York uh, when we were dating, and uh, we were taking the subway back from Redeemer, and uh, I remember she's like talking about somebody that we had both known from a long time ago. And she was saying how she was updating me and how this particular sister had been under great spiritual attack. You know, that she had been suffering from mental illness. And that she just thought that, you know, Satan was trying to stumble her and attack her. To which I replied, I kind of scoffed. I was like, you don't actually believe in that stuff. You don't actually believe in these ideas of, you know, demons and possession and these evil forces attacking us. I was like, you know, you as somebody who is in the medical field, you should know better than most that a lot of these things, as you look at the Bible, as you read the Gospel accounts, a lot of these things that they, that they attributed as spiritual attack, those weren't spiritual attacks. Those are just medical conditions. Those are just disease. Those are just mental illness, chemical imbalance. 2,000 years since then, we've had, you know, we've had, med we've had, we've had century after century of, of medical advancement. We've had this thing called enlightenment. I was like, how could you possibly believe 
that there's still this kind of thing going around called Spears or the demonic attacks. And she just got so, so upset at me because I was so quick to, to, to just reject this whole idea of uh, spiritual warfare. And she tried to tell me, like, right, there's, there's been times when I've felt, like, evil presences and stuff. And I, I really, I just rejected her testimony. I was like, it's impossible. It just doesn't make any logical sense. And we just, we really just ended up on that subway car in front of a pack uh, somebody in the middle of New York City, and we were just fighting. Like, we were just like, raised voices, everything. It was the worst voice we, it was the worst fight we ever got into. And that was probably eight or nine years ago, and I'm, I, now I, it's easy for me, to, for me to admit just like all the other fights since then that uh, my wife was right. She was right about spiritual attacks. It became really clear to me, I started buying into this concept um, actually, when we started to plant our church, Church of Beloved, about five years ago. You know, personally for me, like, we started in August, our court. And uh, I, had a, I had been working at the same company for eight or nine years. And I had my mid-year review in July. So not that long ago. And it was the best, best job review I had ever done. You know, they gave me the highest rating. I was making more money for my company than I'd ever, I'd ever hoped or dreamed of. And, uh, and in the review, you know, it's this document that I still have, like, Brian's right, by the end of the year, we're gonna, you know, he's in line with this big promotion. And then sometime in, like, September or something, I was trading in the markets, and then there happened to be this 15-day span, 15 days in a row, when I lost money consecutively, every single day. You know, and it's like, if you think of it statistically, it's really just impossible. Everything should kind of be a 50-50 kind of thing in the markets. You know, so to lose money can take you over 15 days. It was just unheard of. I was just sitting there, and day after day after day, if I thought it was going to go up, it went down. If I thought it was going to go down, it went up. And day after day after day, it's just losses and losses and losses. And I just thought to myself, this is, this is weird. And the months that transpired from July to the end of the year, by the end of the year, they were just like, I looked my, 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 my end of year review was basically like Brian has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and soon after that, right before we actually launched our public service, I uh, public services, I was like, oh. It was just so weird how this thing just shifted. And it was and it actually, you know, I I struggled with that. You know, like leading up to the launch, I was really in a dark place because it's like I had been thinking about leaving this job for a while. I was kind of like praying about it because so I kind of wanted to get out of there. And, uh, but it's kind of like when you're dating somebody and you're not happy in a relationship and you're thinking about breaking up with them, but then they break up with you first. <laughs> it's still a really, really hard thing to accept. It's just like, you don't want me? <laughs> you know, so I, so, so, so I kind of got my, my the gears in my head moving about is this spiritual attack something real? And then it, 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 it extends far beyond my personal life. Pastor Dave, when we were planting the church, right around that, uh, was his, his both of his parents were diagnosed with cancer. His father, you know, he shared a little bit about it, but he, he passed away soon after we started our public service. Uh, the guy that we brought in, some of the people here know, but the worship pastor that we uh, brought in from Virginia, you know, a healthy, young, normal guy. And then just out of nowhere, he develops his eye condition. Like something went wrong with his retina, and he had to get these these two surgeries on his eye. Like never had any pre-existing condition, and the treatment for this was to like stick a needle in his eye and do something. But like he actually had to sit for like a month or two just looking down the whole time. Really paralyzed his his efforts and his availability for our church plant ministry. Countless other stories, like a young girl in our church, and we're not a very big church at this point. Young girl, healthy, breast cancer. You know, a good friend of mine, again, young guy, healthy, basketball player, stomach cancer. And just over and over and over again, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to reason all these things away and think, oh, this is just, this is just chance. This is just, you know, these seasons just come and go, but Time and time again, I'm seeing these things strike our poor people, divorce, all these kinds of things. 
And at, the, at some point, I looked at around me, and I was like, there's no way to deny that God is really dead, that there's some kind of spiritual force that is, that is, that is standing in the way of the way of, 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 of how we want to do our church and how we want to connect to the people and how we want the gospel to go forward in our communities. Now, I think it's an appropriate topic to talk about with you guys because, you know, I've had the, the privilege to, 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 to get to know you guys and got to hear about your, your hearts for this church. The question and answer time yesterday uh, was really telling, and, and a lot of people in this church are, are very committed. You know, you guys have been around for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. And it seems like there's this, there's, there's this movement to like really buy into a vision to, to connect with people and to reach different age groups and all this stuff and to really grow this church. And while that's exciting, you see in the book of Acts when they uh, quote from the book of Joel said, like, your young men will prophesy and your old young men will dream dreams. Well, that's really an exciting thing. I think from our experience in, in church planning, growing on our church, spiritual attack is right around the corner. You know, so when we look at this, this passage in Ephesians, and we're going through Ephesians 6, that passage on the armor of God, you know, we really have to ask ourselves, what if a lot of these, 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 these foundational questions about what spiritual warfare is, what does it look like, what are our roles in it? What are our roles in it? So if I was going to start with questions about this greater concept of spiritual warfare, the first thing I would ask myself is this question. Do we even have to fight? Right? Because that's the first question you should ask whenever you're, uh, whenever you're introduced to a situation that you might have to fight. Do I have to? Because if you give me the option to engage in spiritual warfare with Satan, or to not, I'm going to safely cross the other side of the street and avoid it altogether. I don't want that in my life. If it were up to me, if it was just my decision, I would gladly pass on this fight. I would pass on spiritual warfare. So we must at least question whether it's possible to stay on the side of this. Is it really necessary for us to fight? There's this scene in this movie called uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Two Towers. And like Gandalf and Aragorn are trying to convince this king of Rohan to gather his troops and to confront his enemy in the battle. And the king is a little bit passive, and he responds by saying that he will not risk open war. To which Aragorn responds, open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. Likewise, Forget what we see in our daily lives. Even if we look at scriptures, even though we might, might not want to fight the spiritual warfare, the passage today suggests that spiritual warfare is upon us, whether we would fight it or not. <clears throat> and you might stop me here and say, Brian, are you serious? Are you talking about spiritual warfare, Satan, demonic attacks? And you might say, I like mine. I have a normal, happy life. I get along with most people. I like my job. I find it fulfilling. I have my struggles, sure, but they seem pretty manageable. I live a pretty ordinary life. Spiritual warfare? It can't be me. I'm an accountant. Spiritual warfare. You know, spiritual warfare? I drive a Honda Accord. I drive a minivan. There's no spiritual warfare going on in that life. We must be talking about other people. And I understand that. Most of the time, I probably would feel that way too. But if you consider the context of the passage, it, it casts this idea of spiritual warfare in a different line. Because in Ephesians, the book that our passage is from today, all in all is a practical book. Okay? The, if, if you consider the church of Ephesus, these are not people who are being thrown into jail on account of their faith. These believers in the early church in Ephesus are not being tortured, and they're not being martyred on account of Jesus. If you look at, you know, the book of Acts, and you look at the history of the early church, of all the churches that Paul planted and spent time in, Ephesus is probably one of the most drama-free experiences that he had. And, but here we are in Ephesians 6, 
And he brings up this idea of spiritual warfare right after Paul finishes talking about marriage, family life, everyday employment. He brings up this idea of spiritual warfare. And if you look at the context, it's somewhat abrupt. And there's basically no transition to this new topic of spiritual warfare. And the direct interjection of this spiritual attack passage suggests that Paul, the writer, is really saying, this isn't some good advice to save for later. In your everyday life, you may not realize it, but you're under spiritual attack and you need to hear this now. See, when we go through seasons in our lives where we really do struggle, when tragedy strikes us and we don't understand why, when the weight of our burdens seems to overcome our strength, it's not hard to sense that there's some kind of force or power or evil in this world that is working against us. It makes sense to us during those hard seasons in our life. But it's when things are peaceful and comfortable that we live in this ignorant bliss to the forces that attack our souls. The context of Ephesians makes sense if it is during normal, everyday life, when we are focused on our marriages, our families, our children, our jobs, that we must listen to this morning and be reminded that spiritual warfare is waging all around us. Open spiritual warfare is upon you. We must fight. The next question I want to ask then is, who must we fight? Who is our enemy? If you look at the scripture, Satan is described as a, a roaring lion who crawls around looking for someone to, de- to devour. He's a deceiver and he's a liar. The book of John says that he's a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. In this passage, in this passage today in Ephesians, he's described as a schemer. The devil has schemes. And the translation for that word might be methods. Satan has a strategy and he's going to use it to stumble you in your walk with Christ. He's going to use it to steal your joy and your identity as the love of God. We often, at a human level, try to fight it off by countering these attacks with our own methods. You know, a lot of, you know, our church is kind of a younger demographic, so a lot of times these people are struggling with loneliness. And they come to me and they they really think, they honestly believe that marriage and family is the answer to that emptiness inside of them. The Logos being a more mature church, I don't know, I'm sure you guys know that that marriage and family is not the answer to the loneliness that plagues us. A lot of these people uh, deal, a lot of people at Church of Love, they deal with uh, feelings of inadequacy a lack of value, of identity. And they sit there and they tell me that all they want to do is focus on their work and they want to, they want to get the degrees that they, that, they, that, they, that they want to seek after and they want to get these promotions and raises and titles and all that stuff. And they, 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 they try to tell me that, Brian, once I get that, then that hole will be filled in my heart. But again, Logos, you guys, you guys are more mature church. You guys have never been in your careers for 10, 20, 30 years, and you guys know that if it's inadequacy, if it's a lack of identity that is plaguing you, promotions and career advancement is not the thing that will fill that hole. See, we're prone to believe that we wrestle against flesh and blood, like it says in this passage. We think our problems are simply on a human level. But Paul writes, the passage says, it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers, and spiritual forces. See, in a lot of ways, we're like, we're trying to fight these spiritual attacks. We're playing checkers while Satan's playing chess. It's so beyond our understanding that we're really helpless when left to our own devices. It's like those old Apple commercials. You know, where they'd be like, oh, you have this problem, you have this problem, there's an app for that. No matter what race you are, how much money you make, how many years you went to school, or how many friends you have, whatever your weakness may be, Satan's got an attack for that. A 
apart from the gospel, Satan's methods are far greater than our methods. So we understand who our foe is. The next question is, what is my role? What role do I play in the spiritual warfare? What is, what is it that I'm called to do? We see in this passage in Ephesians that three times Paul uses the word stand. And once he uses the word withstand. And David, I mentioned yes, I'm sure you guys all know that. When in scripture, a phrase is repeated several times, it points to emphasis or importance. So we are called to stand in the spiritual warfare. And what does that mean? And why is it so important? Let me ask you guys, Lotus, how many people in this room, you can raise your hands, how many of you guys have gotten into a fight here, like a physical fight? There's a lot of them. You guys are a pretty tough church. <laughs> Me too, believe it or not, when I was a kid, I used to get into a lot of fights. You know, I grew up, I was one of the only Asian kids in my school, and it meant that I faced a lot of racism, I got bullied a lot. And by no means am I claiming that I was a great or even a good fighter. Any stereotype that might have worked in my favor, and then any belief that I knew Kung Fu because I was Chinese, was quickly dispelled once the fighting commenced. <laughs> but lately, for the last year or so, I've been like training Isaiah, my son, who's four years old, how to fight. And I'm trying to make him into, I'm not trying to make him into a killer. I'm not trying to teach him to like, get people in the throat or do bar bars or anything like that. But we wrestle around a lot. My wife always asks me why I'm doing this. She's like, are you trying to make him violent? No. I, you know, he's going to daycare now, he's going to school, and I just wrestle around with it because I want to train him to get away from being pinned down. I'm always trying to, like, get him on the ground, I want to teach him, this is how you got to escape and get back on your feet. Because there's one thing that I learned from all those fights that I used to get into, and it's that you always have to stand on your feet. It's because if you're on your feet, you have options. You know, you can move forward and attack, you can pivot around and defend yourself, or you can simply just turn around and run away. <laughs> when, you're in, when you're on your feet, you're relatively safe. See, I, in the past, I, I, I honestly got punched in the face by pretty strong guys, and I'm still here to talk about it. But when you lose your footing is when you're really in danger. Most people that you meet are not skillful enough to really just roundhouse kick you in the face. At this point in my life, I'm not sure I'm flexible even to get my legs that high. But when you're on the ground, when you lose your footing, it's there when you're actually in great danger. It's when knees and kicks and stomps can really cause significant damage. So for Isaiah, all I want to do is teach him, just get off the ground and get back on your feet. See, in a fight, you have to stay on your feet. It's why all those fighting sports are based on that same principle. If you're on your feet, it means that you can still stand. And that's really what Paul says that God wants for us in spiritual order. He doesn't want us to go and like uppercut Satan and knock him out with one shot. He just wants us to stay in the fight, to endure, to last. Jesus is going to come back one day. He's going to cast Satan into the lake of fire. The victory is coming. We are just called to stand until that day. Jesus is the champion without us. So all we're called to do is to stand to hold the line. And the next question I would ask is, what resources do I have? What do you have at your disposal in this spiritual fight? And obviously in this passage we know that Paul says that we have this armor of God. And it's not just any type of armor, again, it's the armor of God. And I haven't read this in any commentary, none, but I have this belief that both Paul and the audience must have been aware of Homer's great work, the Iliad. And if you remember that famous work, armor plays a very, very prevalent role. In one particularly famous scene, after the great Achilles, the greatest fighter, the battle decides to remove himself from the conflict. His good friend Patroclus asks to borrow his armor so that he can return to the fight and the Trojans might mistake him for the great Achilles. 
and at the fear and intimidation of seeing the champion, champion Achilles return to the field would turn the tide in the favor of the Greek alliance. There's this idea that wearing someone's armor would not just change others' perceptions of oneself, but it could actually affect the people as the owner of the armor would. That they could actually take a piece of their identity and surround themselves with it. So in putting on the armor of God, Paul is not telling us to put on our big boy pants and go fight the devil with, devil with our own strength. Rather, he is saying to put on the armor of God, which means we must surround ourselves with him, cling to him, bask ourselves in him, and take refuge in our God. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So that idea of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the same concept. Galatians 3, 27 says, For as many of you that were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. We must color ourselves, our whole selves in Jesus. For whatever part is not covered by Jesus, whatever part is not covered by the armor of God, will be prone to these attacks. And then we come to these ideas, these, these concepts that Paul introduces of the shield and the sword. Paul writes, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which one can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So, so he tells you to pick up the shield of faith, and the concept that must have uh, popped into the reader's mind at the time was the Roman shield of the time, and it was called a scudo. Scudo. It was as large as a door, and would cover the soldier entirely. And so it was a very, very substantial shield. And what are these flaming arrows that this huge shield is to protect us from? These flaming darts from the evil. You know, my, I, a lot of you guys are parents, so you guys can remember kind of the first thing that your child is ever really interested in or passionate about. And it's just like, it's, it's just something that kind of sticks in your mind. And my son Isaiah, when he was two or three, he really got, there's this museum down in Chicago called the Museum of Science and Industry, and they had a robot exhibit. And he just totally fell in love with robots. And he just, I mean, even to this day, like, he does, like, robot dances, like, he's always talking about robots. The museum wasn't, was no longer a museum. He simply would call it the robot house. So one day, I thought it would be a great idea. I was like, I'm going to go pick Isaiah up early from daycare. We'll take public transportation down to the museum. And I'm going to surprise him and bring him to his favorite place in the world. You know, so I, I picked him up. He's happy to see me. And I kept telling him, like, I'm going to bring you for a surprise. It's going to be really great. And he was super excited. And we show up to the museum, and there's and it, it was basically closed for a special event for members. We were preparing it. And Isaiah was so disappointed. Because he had gone from being so excited, and now I told him, we, we can't go inside, it's closed. And he was crying, and I was telling him, you know what, Isaiah, though? The good thing is we're actually members, so after they set this up, you know, we can come back, and we can enjoy the robot. I was like, just believe me, like, we'll go get a snack and we'll come back and we'll get to go to the place that we really want to go. So we did that. We, we went to get a snack, we came back and opened for this membership event. And then uh, we walked up to the robot and he was so happy. And I was really excited because so I was like, not only am I going to bring my son to do something that he really likes, it's going to be an amazing learning opportunity because he's going to learn that he can trust in the words of his father. And I won't let him down. And we show up to the robot exhibit, and there's this huge sign on it that says, Sold out. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally walked up to the lady in front of the exhibit, and I begged her. I said, like, You don't understand. <laughs> this is very, very important to me as a father. I'm a first time dad. I can't, you know, like, I gotta get off to a better start than this. And I begged her, like, Is there any way you can let us in? She's like, no, I'm sorry, there's just nothing that I can do. And I was so desperate, I went from ticket teller to ticket teller, and I was like, did anybody not pick up their tickets? Just hoping that someone would, uh, would, would not show up so I could take the tickets and I could bring Isaiah. And, uh, and there, there were no available tickets. And I was so dejected, and I felt so bad about myself that I actually had to call my wife during I was like, 
I feel so awful right now that you have to come pick us up early for this disease. Because I feel like the worst day on earth. And what I'm saying is, like, I went from feeling like the best dad in the world and really proud of myself, and then I get this flaming arrow, and suddenly, just drastic change, and I feel like the, like the first, worst bottom of the barrel of the I guess I would ask you guys that. Do you guys ever get like that anymore? Out of nowhere, this flaming arrow of doubt or self-disdain or insecurity will just hit you out of nowhere. A sudden, unexpected attack that just makes you remember past sin, painful regrets, blasphemy, whatever it might be, then poof, it ignites, and panic and guilt and shame just overwhelm you. There's a lot of times when like, I would feel like I'll just have heard like, this amazing sermon, or I'll just have spent time in the world word, and I'm feeling so close to God, and then my wife comes home, and we get into this terrible fight, and it just reveals all this selfishness in me, and it's just like, poof, it's gone. You know, we spent a lot of time together at this retreat, and I know that a lot of people have been blessed by the worship or days of sermons, and, and, and the sharing time with your brothers and sisters, and there's and something as simple as somebody cutting you off from the way back home, and then poof, all of it can be gone. And what Paul is saying that at those times, we need to raise that shield of faith. We need to refuse to give it to the lie and hold fast the Savior that we have in Christ. We need to remember the gospel, we need to remember the promises that we have in Scripture. And I particularly like this shield of faith illustration that Paul uses because on its own, one shield is not a particularly effective way to protect oneself against arrows. I don't know if you guys have seen Game of Thrones or Braveheart or any of these big battle scenes, but you'll have this line of infantry rushing to the other side. They all have their shields, and like the archers are like shooting at them, and they're all getting stuck in their shields. So what's the next thing the archers do? They just change the trajectory. And then the arrows come from over the top. One shield, one man holding one shield is not an effective way to protect yourself from these arrows. But when fighting in a group, and people at the time knew this, that the Romans had this formation that basically translates into the turtle, where they would stand side by side and they would link up their shields, and they'd have people put shields over the top of them. That when we come together as a group and we lift up our shields, that is an effective way to protect ourselves against arrows. And that's what the local church is, is when we turn to a brother or sister in Christ and we say to them that I am under attack. Satan is attacking me with these fiery darts or arrows. Will you hold up that shield of faith over me? Will you pray for me? Will you speak gospel truth to me? That's what the church is. Lifting up that 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 field that that shield of faith over us, so that we can be covered and have protection from those attacks from Satan. Next, Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I don't know how many of you guys watch it. I guess it's still on TV. But The Simpsons. Uh, there's this episode from years and years and years ago where Homer. The father somehow becomes a boxer. And his special skill set is that he's extremely good at taking a beating. But he has absolutely no punching power. <laughs> so his strategy, which proves to be effective in these boxing matches, is to let the other person punch him relentlessly over and over and over again until he's so exhausted, he's so fatigued, that Homer can just simply push him over. <laughs> but you see, brothers and sisters, a lot of us approach spiritual warfare in the same way. We just take a pounding from Satan over and over again. We do nothing to fight him. The problem is, is that Satan is a formidable foe, and he doesn't tire easily. He doesn't wear, wear himself out, and the spiritual attacks do not stop. And that's why the sword, the word of God, it's important. It's the only offensive weapon that Paul lists. And it's listed as our only hope in defeating Satan. And we have no better example of this utilization of the Word of God as a sword 
than from our Lord Jesus himself. Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we see this in the book of Matthew, when Jesus is tempted three times by Satan, and each time, like a hot knife through butter, Jesus uses scripture to repel Satan's attacks. So we're also we're noting that Satan, when he's attacking Jesus, when he's trying to tempt him, he does it by misusing scripture. But Jesus' mastery of it allows him to see through the deception and speak to what is true. We have seen the effectiveness of the Word of God when it yielded with the right understanding. And that's why we as a local church, we as brothers and sisters of Christ, we can't show up to this spiritual warfare without a wealth weapon. We must not be Homer Simpsons. We have to fight back. And are you sick of disease, prejudice, poverty, suicide, temptation, all the other sin evil that Satan uses in his schemes? And we need to memorize that scripture, the promises of God, the Word, and we need to strike back the gospel truth. Another, one of the other questions I would ask is why are we even fighting? You know, it's because what really I struggled with for a long time when I didn't buy into this concept of spiritual warfare is that if God is all powerful, why doesn't He just defeat Satan right now? If God is who we say He is, why doesn't He end the suffering and just let us rejoice immediately in the victory? You see, if God is good, and if we believe that He works for the good of those that love Him, if we believe that he is the good shepherd who came to give life and give it to the full, wouldn't things be a lot better for us if there was no Satan and no spiritual warfare? I really struggle with this. It's an answer that long eluded me. But when I prayed about this, when I was praying through this passage, I started to think about the St. Crispin's Day speech found in Shakespeare's Henry V. If you remember that from high school or whenever we read it, the English are about to fight this huge battle against the French, and they're badly outnumbered. It looks like a certain defeat on the battlefield. It's not looking good, and the morale of Henry, who's English, the morale of his troops is basically at an all-time low. But before the battle, King Henry comes out to his troops. He gives this rousing speech. And he basically says that today is a holiday called St. Crispin's Day. And if we get through this battle and we win, those who survive will always have a special reason to celebrate this day. Even years from now, when we're old and sick, when St. Crispin's Day comes along, we'll roll up our sleeves and show off our scars and say, these wounds I had on St. Crispin's Day. And even when age Begin, and even as we age and we begin to lose our memories, the memories of this battle, this great day, will be fresh. So this is the kind of story that a good man will teach his son. And then this, Henry says, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. But he never so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now of that shall think themselves a curse that they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, while his hand speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. This king, Henry, is telling his soldiers that if they fight with him, if they fight with him and survive, that they will be his brothers forever. That they will share something in common that nobody will ever take away from them. That this great ordeal, this battle that will leave them with scars and wounds will never be, never be something that they regret. It will instead be a source of great honor and pride. I think there's something in there that points to the reason why Jesus enlists us to fight against Satan. It's not as if Jesus looks at Satan as a foe and is worried. He's not shook 
He's not scared. He doesn't need us to help in the fight. But we, as followers of Christ, would never fully be able to rejoice in the victory that is assured to us if we do not fight in the trenches beside him. We would never truly understand our salvation if we didn't have a good grasp of the enemy who tried to steal it from us and the Savior who protected us from it. By inviting us to wear the armor of God, we get to understand the gospel in a fuller, more meaningful way. To back things up a bit, what a great king name these people had in heaven, right? Who wouldn't want to fight and bleed and die for such a kid? Somebody who would roll up his sleeves and fight with his soldiers. But as inspiring as that speech must have been, one of the underlying themes of the plays, Henry IV, Part One and Two, and Henry V, is that Henry would not let anything stand in the way of his earthly ambitions. To achieve his objections, through objectives throughout the story, Henry has sacrificed his friends if they, if they stayed, if they were, if they stood in the way, rejecting them, denying, even sentencing one to death. Henry might have been a great king. It was probably telling the truth that he would always had some kinsmanship with these people who fought for him. But there was an obvious limit to his love for them, and there was the love for himself and his crown. But we go to battle with a different type of king. In Jesus, we have the mighty warrior, our Savior, who leads us and fights for us. But do you know how we can trust in the goodness of our king? Do you know how we can believe that even when spiritual warfare overwhelms us, when we, are, when we or those close to us get sick and die, when our plans crumble, when our hearts break, even breathing hurts, we can trust in the goodness of Jesus because he offers us the armor of God to protect us. And the only way he could do that was by taking it off of himself. To back things up a little bit, even Achilles. So Patroclus wears his armor and he has an effect in the battle for a time when Patroclus is slain. And even the greatest warrior Achilles, the champion of all champions, who wants to go and get revenge for his friend, dares not to return to the battlefield until he has new armor to protect himself. Will not make himself vulnerable, no matter how passionate he was for his lost friend. But our king did precisely that. He went to the cross and he took off the armor of God that protected him and he allowed himself to be beaten, mocked, and nailed to that cross. He made himself vulnerable to all the punishment and pain that our sin brought into this world and he withstood it for the glory of God and for our good. See, all the other kings in our lives, your work, your friends, your spouse, your family, they will all ask you to plead for them. They'll ask you to sacrifice for them. They'll ask you to give yourself to them. Only the king we find in Jesus, only he offers to plead for you. He took off the armor of God and bled so that you could be saved. He took, up, he took up the armor of God and bled so that you could put it on. And he calls you to stand and fight the spiritual war so that you may never take it off. So let me ask you this last question. Are you wearing the armor of God today? If it's true that spiritual warfare is happening all around us at this precise moment, have you put on the breastplate, or the helmet, or the shield, or the sword? Do you have any of it on at all? And that's why I think it's so important that after Paul talks to them about this armor of God and putting it on, I think it's so important that Paul ends this passage with prayer. Do you want to put on the whole armor of God? Then pray. Do you want to be well equipped for the spiritual battle? Then pray. Jesus said that apart from the Father, he could do nothing. So no wonder why it says that Jesus often withdrew to solitude to pray. If we want to triumph over Satan, if we want to heal our land, then the Bible says that we need to humble ourselves and to pray. Paul, when he's asking for prayer, he uses the word supplication twice. 
And this isn't praying one of those highbrow prayers, if it be your will, then please give me the honor of God. This is more earnest and humble. This is begging God, please God, cover me with Jesus. Because if you're not winning, you're losing this battle. And if we want to stay in the fight, if we want to endure, if we want to stand, then we must get on our knees and pray. It has the same kind of law, because it's Paul who's asking for this prayer. <coughs> Paul, the, probably the greatest biblical hero outside of Jesus in the Bible, the guy who withstood all this, uh, all this, all this, all this, all this torture, these beatings, these shipwrecks, all these things. He faced spiritual warfare from the God, from the accounts we have in the Scripture. It looks like he faced it straight on. He was a mighty warrior for the gospel. Despite all he, despite all of that, here he was reaching out and asking for prayer so that he could boldly proclaim the gospel. Even Paul needed his brothers and sisters in the Roman church to lift up that shield over him and to pray the gospel for him. He's asking his beloved church members and Ephesus to please raise up your shield. So as we end our time together in this retreat, I, I, I'm so inspired and I'm so blessed to see the excitement and the passion that you guys have for this church and, and the vision that you guys have for, 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 for connecting with the community and reaching out to people and bringing more people into the fold of what the amazing things of fellowship and communion, all these things that are happening at your church. I would just challenge you guys. That we must continue to faithfully pray this armor of God over one another. If you love one another, it's not just about coming and enjoying this time of fellowship. You guys really are blessed by the family community. And that can't simply be it. We must raise that shield of faith over each other and cover our brothers and sisters. We need to wield that sort of spirit and use scripture to speak truth gospel truth over one another. And we can tell each other as this church community that the fiery arrows of Satan will not wound you, not on our watch, and not as I pray for you. So let's pray. Now, Peter Bonhoeffer in his uh, book, Life Together, he shares this, and I'm going to share this. I'm sharing this on the efficacy of it. He basically says this. He says, the gospel spoken to me by my mother is stronger than the gospel spoken for myself. And he's basically saying that as a community, and as a local church, as a fellowship of believers, that's what, that's what we must do for one another. And so as you guys go out and, and, I, and, I, and I sense the energy of how you guys are going to grow, Really just, really just seek that cover from this armor of God. Remember the Savior who took it off so that we could put it on. Let that be what protects you, not in our abilities or what we bring to the table, not in any of the armor that we think is effective or can protect us. We must just be reminded and brought back to that gospel truth. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, removed that protection from Himself and into the cross. So that now, when we are in Christ, when we call ourselves sons and daughters, heirs of Christ, we are now protected in the full holiness, love, faithfulness of Jesus. So spend some time to pray and we're going to worship.